9, verses 7 through 12 in the New Living. And as most of you have heard me preach before, you're, you're going to be in your Bible a little bit. <laughs> I, try to, I try to use a lot of scripture. Branson. All I knew is he wasn't going to be here. <laughs> That's about all he told me. <laughs> Hello, Internet. <laughs> yep. 139, starting in verse 7, we're going to go through verse 12. All right. King David says, I can never escape your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell in the farthest oceans, even there, your hand will guide me. Your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. As Christians, we are thoroughly aware that God is everywhere. And if you're not, newsflash, God's everywhere. Can't get around it, can't do anything to avoid him. He's there. He's been there, he's been waiting on you, and he'll be there once you're gone. He is. But, and John 1 talks about how everything was created by God, and without him, nothing would have been created that was created. It gets wordier than that, but I'm not going there at the moment. But King David talks about how God is everywhere with him. If we didn't know that David was praising God in the psalm, if we weren't paying enough attention, this could sound like complaints about a smothering relationship. I go here, you're there. I go there, you're there. I could fly away, and you're already there. I could go in the darkness. I could convince the light to not be there, and you're there. Luckily, David's praising God, and he's seeing how wonderful a thing that is. It shows how wonderfully intimate King David's relationship with God was. Now, King David's emotional intimacy with God is cataloged in 73 of Psalms 150 chapters. In them, King David shows faith in God in Psalm 62, running from King Saul in Psalm 27, how he responded to attacks on his life in Psalms 59, 52, and 56, society crumbling around him in Psalm 11, raising his children in Psalm 34, the betrayal from a friend in Psalm 55. Everything. But what David did in almost, if not every psalm he wrote, at some point he gave praise to God. It could be... If it was a 50-verse psalm, the la 49 and 50 would be praise if 1 through 48 were complaining. It's just what David did. And it's such a good thing for us to see that no matter what David was going through, no matter what we're going through, we can praise God. But that spiritual maturity comes from an intimate relationship with God. You can't fake that. Now, shy of Jesus, in the whole of the Bible, I believe that King David had the most in emotionally intimate relationship with God in the Old Testament and the Apostle Paul in the New. You can disagree with me. I have no fact behind that. That's just what I see. Now, similar to King David, in the New Testament, Paul spoke of all the torment and the torture he endured for spreading the gospel. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 22 through 33. The tears that he shed over the church in 2 Corinthians 2, chapter 4. Sicknesses he endured in Galatians 4, 13. And the joy he had through Christ, no matter the circumstance, in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10. Again, because of the intimacy of his relationship with God. An intimate relationship is not simply a physical one. Sex is the ultimate physical intimacy you can have in a relationship. And all that requires is you being awake and a little bit of biology. You can disagree with me, but that's about all it takes. <laughs> Genuine intimacy is about allowing emotional vulnerability and honesty without the fear of reproach. Knowing that in your significant other or in an incredible friend that you have, you don't have to put on the mask 
when you, when you don't like something even though you know you should, you can complain to them and they'll listen. And they might tell you you're wrong for not liking it, but they're not, they're not going to slap you down. They're going to try to help you and they're going to listen to you. They're going to let you be whatever you are at that moment and then try to encourage you and build you up. At least that's what it's supposed to be. Great, meaningful friendships are intimate ones, like I said, though they take all different shapes and sizes. Individual people have a comfort level and past experiences that determine the amount of intimacy that they allow from others or that they themselves require in their day-to-day -day life. Now, you can't find that without knowing that person and gaining a relationship with that person. Every form of intimacy requires that relationship to be built over time. One of the things that we often gloss over in the Bible, we talk, I just talked about how King David and the Apostle Paul were so emotionally intimate with God. They would tell God absolutely everything. They would praise God in every circumstance. But we miss the fact that King David had 15 years between the time Samuel anointed him the next king over Israel and he actually took the throne. The Apostle Paul had 14 years between his miraculous conversion and entering into full-time ministry. And in that time, Paul and David were able to develop their relationship with God and to learn from him. Paul says that even though Jesus had already ascended, he learned directly from Jesus in those 14 years by divine revelation and the Holy Spirit living in him. And I have less than no doubt that King David talked to God in that same manner. That he had that face-to-face, -face, simple, straightforward, honest relationship. And it didn't matter that it was before Christ. This is not to say that those relationships were perfect. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, and we're not going to read it because I'm going to give you guys enough scripture later on. <laughs> In 2 Samuel chapter 6, David threw kind of a hissy fit. His friend Uzzah was struck dead by God because he touched the Ark of the Covenant, which is a no-no. They had been taught that. It was back in Exodus, and we're in 2 Samuel. Some time has elapsed. They've gone through all the judges. They've gone through, I imagine, at least a few exiles, though I can't say that for certain. I need to learn my Old Testament a little more. But David said, God, I'm mad, and I don't, wa I don't want the ark. I don't want it back in Israel right now. And God led him. And he blessed, and God blessed the house where the ark was staying. It was there for three months before David finally said, yeah, God, you're right. <laughs> Sorry about that. And he brought the Ark of the Covenant back into Israel. And when it had been returned, David threw a party so extravagant that at the end of the chapter, his wife reprimanded him for looking like a fool and dancing shamelessly out in the streets. She said, what are the house servants going to think? What are your subjects going to think? And David said, I don't really care what they'll think. They'll probably think better of me for it. Such was the strength and the closeness of David's relationship with God. A three-month a three month freeze out, and everything's back. Everything's perfectly fine. But the thing is, God wants more intimacy with you than that. He honestly wants as much as you're willing to give him. That's frightening. Because he'll never take more than you give, but he will always want more. Luckily, he's God, and he's deserving of more, and we should give him more. I'll get to that later. God's calling? <laughs> okay. He hung up. He knew you were in service. That's what it was. <laughs> now, like I said, God won't take any more than you're willing to give. And in the Bible, other examples, outside of King David and Apostle Paul, other examples, examples of people's intimate relationships with God abound. In the Garden of Eden, God walked through the garden in the cool of the day, looking for Adam and Eve after they had eaten of the apple of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I said those words all in the right order. It was not out of God's habit to do that. Otherwise, why did he find it odd that they weren't there? It's in God's habit to do that. In Isaiah 41, chapter 8, God called Abraham his friend. Exodus 33, 11 says that God spoke with Moses face to face as one speaks with a friend. Now, this is not a literal face to face. This is our idiom, face to face. 
Because later on in that chapter, God says, no man can see my face and live. Clear that up, because it confused me. And he wants that relationship with each of us. He wants that. So much so that he canceled our debt so we could have the more intimate relationship with him, not having to go through high priests, not having to go through sacrifices. It's one of the pastor's favorite verses, but you're going to get to hear it from my mouth. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, in the Amplified. It says, It was God, personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them and committing to us the message of reconciliation the message of the restoration to favor. So God did all that work. God's plan was to do all that work. So how do, we, how do you know that your intimacy with God is lacking? To be honest, if it is, you are not alone. I was, I was blindsided to find a study while I was researching this sermon online. It was released in 2018. It was that year's finding. It was conducted by the healthcare provider Cigna. And they put out a thing every year called the Loneliness Index. They reported that in a study or a survey done from 20,000 men and women over the age of 18 in the United States, 18 and older, 43% reported, my phone now, 43% reported, it's in an otter box, sorry, 47% reported that they sometimes or always feel left out. 46 reported sometimes or always feeling alone. 43% feel isolated from others. 39% reported that they are no longer close to anyone. 59% reported saying that they always or sometimes feel that their interests are not shared by those around them. 36% of those surveyed feel that there is no one that they can turn to. The study goes on to show that younger generations are lonelier than the older. The Generation Z people, which is ages 18 to 22, reported the most lonely, nearly half of the people in that age group. And the older the generations got, because then you went through millennials, Generation X, baby boomers, and greatest generation, The farther back you go, the less lonely people are. Why? I don't know. But it says that people with daily meaningful social interactions are less lonely than those who don't have daily meaningful social interactions. Fair fair or poor physical health and mental health can lead to greater loneliness. Many, many factors were put into this study conducting and calculating how much how lonely someone is. Depend- and it, things like your sleep, time with your family, exercise, employment status, work-life balance, all of these situations factor into it. And in most of those cases, too much was almost as bad as not enough. Individuals running a single parent home reported as feeling lonelier than individuals who lived alone. Oddly, what does not factor into people's loneliness is social media use. Despite what you've been told, this giant study says that you can be on social media all the time or none of the time, and it has no bearing. I thought so. So there is clearly an issue with people feeling alone. If you feel alone, you don't have an intimate relationship. Intimate relationships are constant communication. Everyone that I know has at least one friend. It doesn't matter if you haven't seen them in an hour, a week, a month, three years, however long it's been, you pick up right where you left off. It's like you never left. You can call them in the dead of the night. They, they know that they're, you know that they're there for you, and that street runs both ways. If they call you, you're there for them. That's the intimate relationship that we need to have with God, that level of companionship. So how can we increase our intimacy with God? Well, it's kind of the same way as with anyone else. 
you strengthen and deepen your relationship through time, talk, and open communication. I don't have all the answers, but the Bible lays out a lot of them. You have to start out first, though. God does give a condition. He gives one condition. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, in the Amplified, it says that, but without faith, it is impossible to please and be satisfactory to him. For whoever would come near to God must necessarily believe that God, is, that God exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him out, earnestly and diligently seek him out. You have to believe that God is there. That's really all he asks. Romans 10, 17 in the Amplified. Now, I heard this verse more times than I can count growing up, but I never knew the address. I finally know the address. So faith cometh by hearing what is told, and what is heard comes by the preaching of the message that came from the lips of Christ the Messiah himself. Or as Pastor Bob says it, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, you, how do you get faith? Well, you have to discover what God is saying. God authored a book, best-selling ever. Many different versions of it, many interpretations. The one you read is going to be the best one for you. <laughs> and it's the Bible. And the Bible even talks about staying in the Bible. It's Psalms 119, verse 105, New Living. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 in the New Living, say that all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. And Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 7 in the New Living, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted. So we've covered how to find out what God says. But some people say, I can't talk to God. I don't know what to do. Well, you pray, which is like talking to your friend across the table from you. <laughs> I honestly think that it would be so easy for us to have an, emo an emotionally intimate relationship with God if we stopped being so doggone religious. <laughs> have reverence for God and do those things. Give him honor and glory because he's the one to whom they are all due. But you don't need to speak in the King James whenever you say a prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, thank thee, Father, for this bounty which we are about to partake. God, thank you for being so good. Thank you for the food on my table. Thank you for the family I've got sitting around me. Bless it to the nourishment of my body and help me to be more like you in all I say, do, act, and think. In Jesus' name, amen. That's all a prayer has to be. I add those two little statements at the end because I need to keep telling myself to act like Jesus in all I say, do, act, and think. Because I spend a lot of time around me and Jesus, I ain't. <laughs> but the Bible talks about praying, obviously. In Luke... Chapter 6, verse 12, in the New Living, it says, One day soon afterward, now he had healed somebody on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees were mad with him because that's what the Pharisees did. After that, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. Immediately after he prayed to God all night, he went to the crowd of followers that he had, and he picked out his 12 disciples. It's worked out for us that Jesus prayed to God all night. Also in the Garden of Gethsemane, that's done wonderful things for us that Jesus consulted the will of God in all things. And he is our example. We probably ought to follow said example. In Proverbs 15, verse 29 in the New Living, it says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. And if you're saved, there is nothing that stops you from being righteous. The Bible tells us that God, that he was made sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If I recall correctly, that's 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. But if it's not that, it's somewhere else. Yep. In 1 Peter, chapter 5, verse 7 in the New Living, it, Peter says, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. 
1 Thessalonians 5.17 in the New Living says, never stop praying. Now, this does not mean that you can't actually stop praying and you can't talk to other people and you can't minister and share the word with them. This isn't that literal. I mean, it is literal, never stop praying. But it's the constant communication, never stop praying. You're driving on the way to work and you're frustrated with traffic. Lord, help me because I don't have bail money. Someone's acting a fool and you need the strength to help them and to be the person who God made you to be so that they can turn into who God wants them to be. That, never stop praying. The shortest prayer in the Bible, actually, by the way, was said by the Apostle Paul, and it's three words. Lord, help me. A ship was going down. He didn't have time for the formalities. He cried out, Lord, help me. And God helped him. It worked. I wish I knew where that was. Unfortunately, at the moment, I don't. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 in the New Living, Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Now that's exactly what King David did all through the Psalms. He gave every emotion he had to God and never once did he stop to be unthankful or ungrateful about what God had already given him and realizing who God was. We get a greater revelation of who God is when we recognize it. And for what it's worth, praying in your head is all well and good. But when you pray out loud and you speak those words, if you speak what God tells you to speak, the Bible says that that is what gives commands to angels to do what his word says. They're summoned by his word, not by mine. That is what tells your body to get its act right when you're sick. And you tell yourself, I know that Jesus paid the debt on the cross for me. I know that he paid the debt for, the Bible says he paid the debt for sin, sickness, poverty, and spiritual death. I am free from the curse of the law. I'm not saying those things. God said those things. They're in the Bible. But when I say them out loud, I wish I had a study to back me on it. But it's been shown time and again. Saying the words out loud and your ears hearing you say them makes them real. Thinking them is less effective. I can't say that they're not real because everyone has an internal monologue and all of that. But it's less effective when you don't speak it. And now for our next big chunk of Bible. In the book of James, chapter 5, verses 3 through 18 in the New Living. I told you there'd be a lot. James writes, Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are you sick? Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And if you've committed sins, you'll be forgiven. Little sidebar here. Jesus paid for the penalty for all your sins on the cross, but saying them out loud and hearing someone tell you that they're forgiven, even if it's God inside your head, clears your conscience. And that is such a good thing to have, is a clear conscience. He goes on to say, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you might be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. We could have used that prayer for a week back in March. A little late for that now. But no rain fell for three and a half years. And then, when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. Talking to God is a rather effective means of communication. And we are to live a life of worship. That doesn't mean that you're singing all the time. That doesn't mean that you're dancing in front of God all the time. You need to have that time. Because that's part of surrendering yourself to God and communing with God. And you have to do that to be emotionally intimate with Him. But leading a life of worship is trying to reflect the great change that God has made in your life in every aspect. There's so many different 
definitions for words that are translated as worship in the Bible, I honestly think it's around 60. It's got a lot of different meanings. But it's living the life of worship. In Psalm 71, verses 7 and 8 in the New Living, David writes, My life is an example to many because you have been my strength and protection. That is why I can never stop praising you and I declare your glory all day long. David gives, now I honestly think that in the first statement, there are two reasons given for, sorry, there are two reasons given. I shouldn't, I shouldn't do that. Some people on the internet won't like that. There are two reasons given why David can never stop praising him and he declares God's glory all day long. The first is that his life is an example to many. As Christians, our lives are an example to those of us, to those around us who are weaker Christians or who aren't Christians. I shouldn't say weaker, less mature Christians. And if that wasn't enough reason, God has been our strength and our protection. So we never stop praising him and we declare his glory all day long. Now those are all things that you can do. But I've saved the hardest one for last. And it sounds so simple. Spend time with God and let Him change you. In Psalm 46, verse 10, New Living, be still and know that I am God. You have to be still first. I can't hardly stop talking without something else to do for two minutes. I'm around me a lot of the time. I see the way I act. It's just not terribly in my nature. I always want to be doing something or I feel like I'm not being productive. I feel like I'm not advancing in any way. Even if it's just reading a book and wanting to advance in the story so I'm closer to being done with it. I want to be doing something. But God requires that we sit and meditate on who he is. Now, I have the wonderful ability that I had to convince my wife is an actual thing where I can think about nothing in the right circumstances. It's usually in front of a television. But I can think about nothing. And in those moments, that's, that is when I am at rest. That is when I am still. And when God talks to me the clearest because I'm not actually doing anything to stop me from hearing him. It's not that he doesn't talk, it's that I don't listen. (laughs) And going on in Psalm 34, verse 8 in the New Living, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Taste and see. Those are tangible, physical things that you can do for an invisible God. It's so real to you that you can taste it. You can taste the relief and taste the sweetness of his presence when you're in communion with him. And see that the Lord is good. God will open up your eyes. I am, I have a nasty habit of tunnel visioning. But again, when I'm still and when I'm in front of God, thank you for the support on that, Jonathan. I tunnel vision a lot. (laughs) When I I take the time to be still, God shows me, or I get glimpses as I go through my regular day of the things that God's doing, the little changes here and there that you see in people that show you that God is working in them, the things you catch yourself doing differently that shows you that your relationship with God isn't for naught. You are improving. Maybe not as much as you want to. Maybe not as quick as you'd like to. But you are improving. You just might be in that 14 or 15 year time period that Paul and David were in. There's nothing wrong with that. Got to learn. There's a reason we go to college. reason we go to school. reason we tell our kids to go to school. reason we make them graduate, doggone it. We have to have that time of learning. And these are things that God does for you. We have to let God do the work. In Psalm 147, verse 3 in the New Living, he heals the brokenhearted 
and he binds up their wounds. You have to let him. You can't hold on to the hurt. You can't. It's just, it, if you walk around holding a grudge, you're holding on to it. God won't take what you're not willing to give him, and you are holding on to that thing. But if you let him, he'll take it from you because you've given it, and he'll heal that hurt. And then you can move on. You can improve in that area where you thought you might have been stagnant for a long time and where your friends have probably been telling you that you've been stagnant for a long time because they're not clouded by seeing you through your eyes. And my favorite one for an intimate relationship with God, we're going to do the whole chapter of Psalm 23. Look at how much King David says, I do. And look at how much he says the Lord does, or he does. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need because the Lord is my shepherd. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me besides peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close behind me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. All David does there is respond to what God has done. The only eyes is I have all that I need because he's got God. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death is what the common, commonly known interpretation says. But immediately behind it, he says, I won't be afraid for you're close behind me, protecting me and comforting me as I walk that path. And then lastly, my cup overflows with blessings. It didn't say he was pouring into it. It says his cup overflows. And that I will live in the house of the Lord forever. I didn't have to buy a ticket. I didn't have to be a co-signer on the mortgage. I just get to live in the place. Best way to do it. If someone offered me a house like that, I might even take it. And all of these things are to gain you an emotional intimacy with God. Because we do go through times. We go through trials and temptations. God shows them to us. It was the weirdest thing to me when in Matthew chapter 4, it says that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. I almost didn't know what to do with that. I thought about getting out my Sharpie, but I'd, but I'd already bought the Bible. I couldn't just put it back on the shelf and let someone discover what I did. God does have, God knows where those things are in your life. He knows that you will go through trials and temptations. I hope that my trials and temptations are not as harrowing as King David's. I do not fancy the thought of an assassination attempt. <laughs> I could do without that. But with God beside me, and God behind me, and in front of me, and all around me, for all I know, there's going to be a point in my life where I'm like Jesus in the mob wanting to kill him and he just kind of walks away. And they can't get to him. And that intimacy, that level of protection and love and, and the things that come from that, the Bible says that God will give us a perfect peace that goes beyond all understanding. It says that there is now, no, in Romans 8, it says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You will never be condemned by God in Christ. But to start, back in Hebrews, you must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In other places in the Bible, it says that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth unto salvation. That's your faith, speaking it and believing it. Now, I don't know I like to think I know, but I don't know 
if everyone in here is saved. So what I'd like you to do is bow your head, close your eyes. We're just going to say a simple prayer. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for sending Jesus. Father, I know that I have done wrong in my life. And I know that I need a relationship with Jesus. Thank you, God. I surrender myself to you, and I invite Jesus into my heart. And thank you, Father, for the mighty work you are doing in me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm not quite done yet. I will say that if that's the first time you ever said that prayer, I would absolutely love to talk with you after the sermon's done. I would. You don't have to talk to me. You can talk to somebody else. But I would love to know it. It gives me joy. And the Bible says that whenever a soul gets saved, there's a party in heaven we can't even imagine. I do truly hope we've set a couple bottles loose of their cork. And as is my custom, pastor has his six major areas of life blessing. I like to do benedictions out of the Bible. We will close with Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 through 19 in the New Living. This is Paul's prayer for spiritual growth. I'm going to amend it to make it first person. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower me and empower us with inner strength through his spirit that Christ would make his home in our hearts as we trust in him, that our roots will grow down into God's love and keep us strong. And may we have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love is. May we experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully, and then we will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Thank you all so much for coming. God bless you and be safe as you go home. So Jonathan doesn't tell me. The tithe plate is right up here. Tithe and offering. Be blessed. I love you all.